Okay, so um, we have began with the seven for cause and effect method. We have covered equanimity and recognizing sentient beings to be your mother. Today we will continue with the section of remembering their kindness. Okay, so um, if we're going to our text, halfway page 24, if you have a printed copy, it says, once you have developed a genuine experience, proceed to contemplate the next topic. So once you have generated a genuine experience of, ge of recognizing all sentient beings as your mother, then you proceed with the next topic, which is remembering their kindness. So while meditating on the Guru Yidam on the top of your head, so remember that you must have uh, uh, done the preliminaries and in particular you have reached the sixth preliminary which is making requests. So we're making these speci specific types of requests to the guru, visualizing now the guru at the top of our heads and we have made this request that we, we and all other sentient beings we will be successful in generating these uh, realizations that begin from equanimity all the way up to developing the mind of bodhicitta. So we have made this general request, which because in the beginning we make the request for whatever we're going to meditate on the actual part of the session, right? So we made the request and now we have uh, started with this contemplation. Okay, so we're remembering the kindness. So whilst meditating on the Guru Yidam on the top of your head, imagine this life's mother clearly in front of you, not as a young person, but rather as an old person. So it is said that this is um, sort of like a very useful point and that if you visualize the, ma the mother not as being young but as being older in age, you will be able to generate the realization easier. So as you visualize her as an old person at old age, you contemplate the following. This mother of mine is my mother, not only in this life, but has been my mother for countless times in my previous beginningless lives. So not just, she has been the mother to me, not just in this life, but countless times in the past. In particular, in this life, she has been extremely kind to me. She has looked after me with love at the beginning when I was in the womb. So you start considering the kindness of the mother in this life from the beginning of this life. So from the time of gestation, where you spent nine months in the womb of the mother, she took care of you at that time. And then um, after my birth, she has placed me on a comfortable bed. She has lifted me with her ten fingertips. She has kept me warm, close to her body. She has welcomed me with loving smiles. She has looked at me with admiring eyes. She has removed the mucus from my nose with her mouth. She has wiped my excrement with her hands. She has considered my light discomforts as more serious than her own life-threatening sufferings. She has offered to me anything she managed to obtain to the utmost of her muscles, regardless of sins, sufferings, bad reputation, and even her own life. According to her ability, she has accomplished limitless happiness and benefit for me, and she has protected me from limitless suffering and harm. So you begin considering the benefit and the kindness, countless benefit of the mother in your previous lives and also in this life, starting from the beginning of this life. So as you can see, we really consider the kindness of the mother in this life from the very beginning until reaching this age. She has really protected us, protected us and offered us everything that we needed. That's why this um, paragraph continues by saying she has accomplished limitless happiness and benefit for me. And she has protected me from limitless suffering and harm. So really here we have a very strong sense of the kindness of the mother. Then, once you have developed a genuine experience focusing on the mother, proceed to meditate focusing on your father and then gradually to all dear ones. So once you have the genuine experience with the mother, recognizing the kindness of the mother in this life, you change the focal object to the father and eventually other people that are close to you. So imagine your father clearly in front of you and reflect that he has been your mother for countless times in 
my previous beginningless lives. And he has been extremely kind to you because whenever he has been your mother, he has taken care of you with love in the same way that these life's mothers have done. So once you've done the mother, you move to the father, you visualize the father and you think, okay, my father in a previous life, he has played the role of a mother. And when he was a mother to me, he was as kind as the mother of this life. Then you deal with, you visualize someone who is a friend. And once you have developed a genuine experience with the father and the friend, then you proceed to meditate, focusing on all sentient beings who are strangers. Imagine strangers clearly in front of you. So you change the visualization out to the strangers. So as we say, having done this uh, meditation with the father and uh, those who are dear to us, we then move to the strangers. And the way that we reflect is, although it looks like at this time, those strangers and me don't have any connection. So superficially, if you just look at these people, the initial re reaction is that we are not connected, right? That's why I call them strangers. They have been my mother for countless times in my previous beginningless lives. And they have been extremely kind to me because whenever they have been my mother, they have taken care of me with love in the same way that this life's mother has done. So then uh, it says, once you have developed a genuine experience, so the genuine experience here is for the strangers, then you proceed to meditate, focusing on sentient beings who are enemies. So imagine an enemy clearly in front of you and reflect. What is the reason to consider him or her as an enemy? So obviously we categorize people as enemies because they have harmed us in some way in this life. This person has been my mother for countless times in my previous beginningless lives. And whenever he or she has been my mother, she has accomplished limitless happiness and benefit for me. And she has protected me from limitless suffering and harm. In particular, due to the intense love we felt, I did not bear to stay even for a short time without this person. And similarly, she did not bear to stay without me. So this person that we consider to be an enemy now and we want to keep our distance and avoid and so forth, in a previous life, when that person was our mother, we could not bear to be separated. We did not want to spend any time away from that mother due to the affection between us. Except for the negative karma that brought about the transformation in the present situation of being enemies, this person is only the mother who looked after me with affection. So it's only due to some bad karma that this relationship changed. So then it says, once you have developed a genuine experience, genuine experience here focusing on emptiness as being kind due to having been a mother uh, to you in the past, then you proceed to meditate on all sentient beings' kindness. Okay, so as you can see here, there is a way that we progress with this meditation. We induce the experience by um, focusing on one particular focal object. And once we generate a strong feeling or experience with that, then we change the focal object. So we begin by focusing on the mother, the mother of this life, and we try to remember all the kind things and all the benefits she has provided in this life. And when we have this genuine experience that says yes she has been very kind to me then we shift the focal object and we focus on the father so now we start thinking the father has been a mother to me in a previous life and has been so kind so again we have to induce this recognition of the kindness then we focus on those who are near and dear to us and again once we develop that experience this strong feeling we move into those who are neutral, strangers, then we move to the enemies, and then we move to all sentient beings. So if you do it like this gradually, you will be successful, and you will find that there is a very extensive presentation in other Lamarim texts in terms of presenting the kindness of the mother. Okay, so the 
Dennis says, having meditated in this way on remembering their kindness, the next step is to meditate on repaying the kindness. So what we have done so far, we have uh, considered the kindness of all sentient beings. As um, so we have seen the example of the mother symbolizing the, very ki the great kindness of sentient beings. And once we remember this great kindness, the next step is to have the wish to repay the kindness if you recognize that you have received kindness that you have been supported so for example let's say you have received food and clothes and presents and other other things that supported you but you have no intention of repaying the kindness this is considered to be extremely bad manners so in general in society when we acknowledge kindness then we have there is this um, uh, this recognition of the kindness, then we acknowledge it and then we wish to repay it. Otherwise, we become like uh, people who, you know, everyone would criticize us. They would see the fault in our behavior. So we say that we are Mahayana practitioners, but at the same time, we have no wish to repay the kindness of sentient beings. So this is something that we have to address because it is a very embarrassing situation to say I'm practicing the Mahayana, but I have no intention of repaying anybody's kindness. If we examine the situation of our teacher, Buddha Shakyamuni, he developed equanimity towards all types of sentient beings. He contemplated on the great kindness of the six types of migrating beings. And then he had a very strong wish to repay their kindness. And by considering this, this is how he trained in order to develop bodhicitta. As a result of developing bodhicitta, he reached a state of enlightenment. So now compare Buddha Shakyamuni who have reached a state of enlightenment with ourselves. We are left behind in the suffering of samsara because we have no intention of repaying this kindness. So it is very good to kind of like set up some extra motivation um, at the beginning of doing this practice by thinking this way. So, um, we, we begin by doing this, uh, we're repaying the kindness. So we have set ourselves up thinking, I will definitely repay the kindness. And then whilst meditating on the Guru Yidam on the top of your head, you contemplate as follows. All the mothers who have taken care of me with affection since beginless time are disoriented by the demon of the affliction and they're like crazy without control over their mind. They are devoid of the eye, which is the path leading to fortunate rebirths and definite goodness. They miss a spiritual friend who can guide them like a guide for blinds. So we start building up here the description of the situation that our mother finds herself in. So we say this mother that has raised us with great kindness is now very old. She's old and uh, she's blind. All right, so she cannot see where she's going. And uh, if she had someone who could guide her, that would be that would be pretty good. However, she's old, she's blind, and she has no one to guide her. In addition to that, she's demented, as she has dementia or she has become like a crazy person. And her body is now unstable. So her arms and legs and so forth, they cannot really support her very well. And she's walking in a terrain that is a very difficult and dangerous terrain because there are many cliffs and many precipices from where she might fall off. So as you can see here, the situation is getting worse and worse. So you have someone who's walking very unstable. Their mind is crazed. They cannot see where they're going and they are walking at the edge of the cliff. So if you were the son or the daughter of that person, wouldn't you consider it that it is your responsibility to intervene in this situation and try to help and protect your mother who has raised you with great kindness? Or would you sit in the back and watch this as if it was like a spectacle? Oh, look, my mother is walking by the cliff without intervening. So as you can see, we have a number of analogies here. 
So it says uh, they are disoriented by the demon of afflictions and they are like crazy. So due to afflictions, they have become like crazy without control of their mind. They are devoid of the eye. They are blind because they cannot see the path leading to fortunate rebirths and definite goodness. They do not have a guide, so they miss a spiritual friend who can guide them like a guide for the blinds. Due to bad habits, they are obscured and ready to fall at any moment. To repay the kindness of all sentient beings who are now near the terrifying abyss of samsara in general, and in particular near the terrifying abyss of the three lower realms, I will place them in the bliss of liberation after I have liberated them from all samsaric suffering because there will be any, there would not be any greater shame for me than to neglect them. So this is their determination. Uh, it will be totally shameful if I neglect them. I will save them from all the samsaric suffering and I will place them in the bliss of liberation. So this is how we repay their kindness. We are determined to repay the kindness in this way. And then we say, I beseech you, Supreme Guru Yidam, bless us so that we can practice in this way. Okay, so let's go over it once again because there are quite a lot of analogies in uh, this section of uh, med meditating or thinking, uh, our contemplation in terms of repaying a kindness. So we have this analogy here of a mother who is an old mother and the first characteristic is that she is blind. Right, so she does not, she cannot navigate on her own. But if you have a blind person, if that blind person has a guide, someone to help them, uh, the situation is manageable. But here we are dealing with an old mother who is blind and has no one to guide her. So she has no guide. Anyway, even though you might be blind and you have no guide, if your mind is clear and stable, then sort of like you could, with your own walking stick, you would carefully navigate and go from A to B. But here we're dealing with something who is old, who is blind, has no guide, but also is mentally unstable. You have someone who is crazy. But even if you had someone who is blind and crazy and is wandering around, if that person had a steady body, steady legs and could walk properly, that person would not be in great danger. But here we have someone who is very unstable and with every step they take, they are in danger of falling over. Anyway, even if you have someone who is blind without a guide, who is crazy and has an unstable body, if they are walking in an area that is flat and covered with grass, at least there's not so such a big danger. But here you have someone who has all these characteristics and is walking at the edge of a cliff. So you have a blind person not knowing where they're going, unstable mentally, unstable physically with every step they take, they uh, might lose their balance and they're just walking at the edge of the cliff. And you are the child of that person and you are observing this situation. So we say, you know, what will be your reaction here? Would you just sit back and say, okay, let's see what happened next or would you feel that you have this responsibility and the responsibility falls upon you to protect this old, blind, crazy, unstable mother? So as we can see here in the text, it says that um, since beginningless time, they are disoriented by the demon of afflictions and they are crazy. So due to afflictions, their mind has become unstable. And they are blind because they cannot see the path leading to fortunate rebirths and definite goodness. Definite goodness is the state of liberation and omniscience. They do not have a spiritual guide. Um, they um, are obscured and they have bad habits. So they are ready to fall at any moment, like they are unstable on their feet. And they are walking 
uh, by the cliff. So any moment they might fall down. Fall down here means they will fall into samsara, and in particular, they will fall into the lower realms. Okay, so you... Um, you realize that, you know, it's a very dangerous situation and you say, I need to protect them. I need to repay the kindness of this person. So you decide that you want to save them from this danger. You have to save them from the suffering and you want to give them happiness. So what type of happiness you want to provide for this being? Because all those sentient beings in samsara, from their own side, with their own means, have been able to achieve different types of samsaric happiness. They have enjoyed this. They have achieved this. So temporary samsaric uh, happiness is something they have experienced. So your aim is not to provide some temporary samsaric uh, happiness, which ultimately turns into suffering. But what you want to provide is a long-term real happiness. So basically, you want to provide to provide for them the ultimate happiness that comes with liberation and with obtaining the state of omniscience. So when you say, I will repay the kindness, this is what is your determination, right? So it says, I will place them in the bliss of liberation after I have liberated them from all samsaric suffering because there would not be any greater shame for me than to uh, neglect them. So this is how we think. So we have some other instruction also in terms of uh, meditating here and repaying the kindness. So you can meditate in a situation where you have a mother that has the only child and that the mother has fallen into the sea or into you know a fast moving river and so forth she doesn't know how to swim and she is about to drown so imagine now what will be the proper reaction of that single child obviously the mother has no one to look for for any help or support other than that child and imagine the child watching the mother drowning but it's just staying, you know, by the beach and continuing to play and enjoy himself or herself. Now, wouldn't that be like the most uh, shameful thing, the most, uh, in, you know, indespicable um, attitude towards the mother? It would be, right? So here we are. We see all sentient beings who have fallen into the ocean of samsara. They suffer. And instead of... Uh, considering their situation, even though we have the ability to help, even though we can do things for them, we just remain totally self-centered and we only think about our enjoyment, you know, our entertainment, our well-being. Okay, so this is a different uh, type of instruction. You can meditate on whichever or you can meditate on both see whichever one is most beneficial for you to generate this attitude of wishing to repay the kindness. So as you can see here, we can cover uh, a few steps, uh, recognizing all sentient beings as being our mother, remembering the kindness, wishing to repay the kindness. These first three steps are actually for the sake of generating this aspect of seeing them as very pleasant and very attractive. Obviously, before we're able to recognize all sentient beings as our mother, remembering the kindness and so forth, the preliminary step is to establish equanimity. So in this way, we train the mind with the intention to um, bring about others' well-being. And first of all, we have to establish the basis for developing this attitude. Establishing the basis has two steps. The first step is the step of equanimity. And the second one is having affection for all sentient beings. And this comes from recognizing them as your mother, remembering the kindness and wishing to repay the kindness. So after this, establishing the basis, we have the actual development of the attitude of uh, uh, being of wanting to be to bring about others' welfare. So then we continue with cultivating love and compassion, special intention and then bodhicitta. 
So we need we move into the next um, topic, which is how to meditate on love. So imagine someone dear to you and whom you love with a constant and intense feeling, uh, someone like your mother, and you contemplate. Not only this person is devoid of any uncontaminated bliss, she is also devoid of contaminated happiness. The present so-called happiness she has will transform into suffering. Wishing for happiness, she strives tenaciously, but this will only act as the cause of the unfortunate rebirth suffering in next life. And in this life, it will only cause a lot of pain for the hard work and the austerities involved. So you focus on someone that you really love, someone like your mother, and you say, look, they are striving for happiness. Of course, they don't have uncontaminated happiness, but it's very hard for them even to get the contaminated happiness. In order to get some measure of happiness, they work very hard in this life. They exhaust themselves in this life. However, due to their afflictions, their attachment and hatred and so forth, they create a lot of negativity. And this will create a lot of suffering in their next life, right? So... It will only cause a lot of pain for the hard work and the austerities involved. Anyhow, that is not at all real happiness. Therefore, contemplate how wonderful it would be if this being would be endowed with happiness and the cause of happiness. May she be endowed with happiness and the cause of happiness. I will endow this being with happiness and the cause of happiness. I beseech you, Supreme Guru Yidam, Bless us so that we can practice in this way. So um, as we did before, there are stages in this meditation. We begin doing this meditation by focusing on someone who is very dear to us. So the example here is the example of the mother. And when a very strong feeling, very strong experience is generated, we change the focal object from the mother to some other person who is a friend. Then from a friend, we move to someone who is, to sorry, from the mother, we move to the father. From the father, we move to someone who is a friend. From the friend, we move to someone who is a neutral person, like a stranger. Uh, Then from the stranger, we focus on the enemies. And if we are capable of generating this attitude for the enemy, we move to all sentient beings. So as a, we have different um, uh, instructions here for performing this meditation. After you have the wish to repay the kindness of sentient beings, the next step is to meditate on love. And when you meditate on love, here we need to focus a lot on what is happen- happiness and what is suffering. All right. So, for example, we examine sentient beings. We examine sentient beings and we say, actually, they do not have an experience of true happiness. So, (laughs) if we look at the lower migrations, if we look at the animals, the hungry ghosts and the hell beings, right, anything that appears to them, Everything that they meet, everything they interact with them is only the cause for suffering. They do not have a chance for any experience of happiness. If we look at the beings in the fortunate migrations, so the gods, the demigods and the humans, they do have um, occasions of happiness, but it is never uncontaminated happiness. It is always contaminated. If it is contaminated happiness, it means it's not going to last. It means it's very quickly is going to change into suffering. And in addition to that, the pervasive suffering is something which is always present, forever present in the situation. Right. So even if you look at the beings in the higher realms um, where, you know, they progress into higher and higher states, you can see that the causes of happiness are actually very rare to establish. So consider that all sentient beings are in that state. They do not experience, either they don't experience any happiness at all or what they experience and what they consider to be happiness 
actually is contaminated, is not real happiness. So therefore, you start thinking, I will bring happiness and the cause of happiness to all sentient beings. May they have happiness and the cause of happiness. I will be the one who will bring this about. Right, so I guess I was uh, laughing before. We can see he was distracted. A lot of uh, monkeys come to his house and then the little monks try to disperse the monkeys. So there was a little bit of a monkey, a little monk's uh, sin. All right, okay, so we are meditating here on love and it is actually very good to take the opportunity to do the extensive meditation on love and if you do that you focus on all sentient beings and you look at them and you see in particular we have done this uh, presentation of the suffering that sentient beings experience in different um, types of rebirth. So we have looked at beings in the lower migrations, we have looked at beings in higher migrations, and we have looked at the type of suffering that exists in each one of those. So once we, you bring into mind all these different types of suffering, you start meditating and saying, wouldn't it be wonderful if all sentient beings had the opportunity to escape those eight states where they have no freedom at all? Wouldn't it be wonderful if they all obtain a good physical rebirth? Wouldn't it be wonderful all those sentient beings who are lacking the resources of food and accommodation and clothes and so forth, may they all receive everything that they are lacking? Wouldn't it be wonderful if all sentient beings who do not have any friends, genuine friends who can help them and support them, wouldn't it be great if they got those friends? Wouldn't it be wonderful if they all met with Mahayana teachers and they were able to shake away and remove their ignorance and confusion in terms of the three pitakas? Wouldn't it be wonderful if the three doors of body, speech and mind were not under the influence of afflictions but actually had the power and the determination to establish Dharma according to their wish? Wouldn't it be wonderful if, if all sentient beings had faith for the three jewels and if they were able to engage in the practices of generosity and the other perfections? Wouldn't it be wonderful if they could all engage in the three higher trainings and were able to develop bodhicitta? Wouldn't it be wonderful if they could all complete their two accumulations of merit and wisdom and finally obtain the state of Buddhahood? So you contemplate all these all of those things in stages and you say it wouldn't be wonderful if they have all this may they have all this i will cause them to have all this so i'm going to dedicate my root of virtue to make sure that sentient beings will actualize all this state so this is how we perform an extensive meditation on love Okay, so it's actually, it is said that it is greatly beneficial if we perform this type of meditation. So when you're sitting there thinking, wouldn't it be wonderful if all sentient beings had a good rebirth? Wouldn't it be wonderful if all those who are hungry and thirsty and destitute would have their stomach full, they got everything that they need for? And then you keep praying like this, making these wishes that they meet with every type of happiness, temporary happiness happiness and ultimate happiness and you say may they have this happiness and the cause of this happiness I will cause them to have all this guru deity please bless me to be able to do that so great benefit in meditating on love in this way Okay, so it is said that meditating on love brings about great benefits. There is a list of eight good qualities or eight benefits that come from that. So it says deities and humans will love you and they will also protect you. So that means that um, demons and non-humans and non-humans will not cause any harm to you. You have joy and much physical pleasure. Uh, poisons and weapons will not harm you. You will attain your aims effortlessly and you will be reborn in the world of Brahma. 
So it is said that by meditating on love progressively, you create the causes to take a rebirth as a universal monarch. You take a rebirth as Brahma, the the ruler of the god of of the realm of 33 and finally by meditating on love on all sentient beings you create the causes to obtain the non-abiding nirvana so the next one is to meditate on compassion while meditating on the guru idam on the top of your head first contemplate on suffering miserable beings like sheep being slaughtered by a butcher so when you meditate on compassion the advice is that you have to meditate on a sentient being that is experiencing intense and obvious suffering so we have the example here of an animal that is about to be slaughtered so how do you meditate like this you have to visualize that scene with great detail so um, it says imagine such a being clearly in front of you its limbs are tied tight so you know the legs and the arms are tied together the breast skin tore apart torn apart and the butcher's hand inside its body the animal is fully aware of the impending death. So the animal knows very well that it's about to be killed. It is looking with bulging eyes the Buja's face. Think the miserable state it is, it is in due to this suffering. Therefore, contemplate how wonderful it will be if this being would be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May this being be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. I will free it from suffering and the causes of suffering. I beseech you, Supreme Guru Yidam, bless us so that we can practice in this way and so forth. So to be successful in generating compassion, you have to visualize a scene like this with intense suffering. Okay, so um, after we have done the first uh, meditation on compassion by focusing on an animal that is about to be slaughtered, the next focal object, once you develop this genuine experience, is to proceed to meditate focusing on beings like the members of the monastic community who carelessly use the offerings made to them mistakenly. Who, those who break their vows, those who abandon the Dharma, those who hold wrong views and who skillfully commit various destructive actions and cause harm to others. So here we're talking about sentient beings who different uh, types of misbehavior. It comes all of it from ignorance about the law of cause and effect. And because they are ignorant about the law of cause and effect, they create very heavy negativity. So imagine such beings clearly in front of you and reflect these types of behavior. So being careless, doing those things, saying those things, believing those things, don't give happiness in this life. And as soon as those beings die, there is no doubt they will take rebirth in the lower realms because as we say, they have uh, accumulated a very heavy negativity they will have to undergo for a long time various atrocious sufferings. Therefore, contemplate how wonderful it would be if they would be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. I will free them from suffering and the causes of suffering. I beseech you, Supreme Guru Yidam, bless us so that we can practice in this way and so forth. So as you can see here, when we meditate on compassion, the first focal object is a specific type of sentient being who is actually experiencing intense suffering, like this animal that is slaughtered, so currently experiencing suffering. Or alternatively, we focus on those who are currently creating the causes for future suffering, right? So all those people who are misbehaving and so forth. So due to their heavy negative actions, they create the causes of future suffering. Once we have a genuine experience from that, we move to the next focal object. So it says, once you have developed a genuine experience, proceed to meditate focusing on your mother and other dear ones. So now we come to the third focal object, the mother or very close friends of this life. 
due to all the activities performed diligently in relation to these lives, enemies and dear ones, these beings are affected by the suffering of suffering and the suffering of change without any chance to enjoy happiness. Also in this life, they are involved with negative activities and have not generated virtuous thoughts. Therefore, as soon as they die, they will take rebirth in the lower realms and they will have to undergo for a long time various atrocious sufferings. Therefore, contemplate how wonderful it would be if they would be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. I will free them from suffering and the causes of suffering. I beseech you, Supreme Guru Gidam, bless us so that we can practice in this way and so forth. And then once you have developed a genuine experience, proceed to meditate like before, focusing on all sentient beings who are strangers, the enemies, and finally all sentient beings. So these are the stages of meditating in compassion. So we have given here the various focal objects, but actually you can elaborate in this meditation. So the way that you elaborate, you begin by focusing on one specific animal and all creature that is suffering. So here we gave the example of a sheep that is uh, slaughtered by the butcher. So begin by considering that animal, how did it reach in this situation? So you have to say due to some negative karma in their previous life, they accumulated this negative karma and as a result, so they were reborn as an animal. In particular, they were reborn as a sheep. And being reborn as a sheep, you know, it's a type of animal that itself is not aggressive, itself cannot really defend itself and so forth. And it becomes the prey of many other um, animals uh, that, so such as, for example, wild dogs and foxes and, um, you know, what have you, wolves and so forth. And in addition to that, you have humans who are very interested in um, you know, using the meat of uh, this animal. So once, uh, let's say, the butcher or the human who wants to kill it or the other uh, animal that is preying on it uh, has actually set its mind on catching this particular sheep, the sheep has uh, almost uh, no way of escaping and there is no one who will defend this animal from its own, it cannot escape, it cannot go anywhere. So ultimately it is cornered and it is caught. And after it is caught, it is tight, you know, the legs and the arms are tight, um, are tied with a rope. And from that point onwards, um, you know, there are many types of suffering. It's already experiencing quite a lot of fear. And then the actual killing takes place. And there are different ways in which you can kill an animal. So some people might kill the animal by suffocate them, by tying a very tight rope around their throat so they cannot breathe, whilst others will slaughter them by cutting the throat and killing the animal in this way. And there are many other ways to kill them as well. And when they are killed, they cannot even cry. They cannot even open their mouths and cry. And the butcher who is dealing with this animal has no compassion. The butcher will definitely carry out the activity to the end. And when the butcher carries out this activity, there comes a point where the consciousness of that animal separates from the body and then it moves into that state of fear and pain and suffering. It moves into another rebirth. Usually it's not another good rebirth. So contemplate like this, the suffering of this animal in great detail until you have a very strong feeling that finds that suffering unbearable. And then once you have that sense that this suffering is unbearable, you uh, very naturally will have, will have that reaction that says, I wish that sentient being is free from suffering. May they be free from suffering. I will cause them to be free from suffering. 
Guru Deity, please bless me to be able to do so. So you start with one specific suffering that is experiencing, uh, one specific sentient being that is experiencing suffering. Then you move into your mother, then to friends, then to strangers, then to enemies, and then to all sentient beings. Do not attempt to do this meditation on compassion by starting with all sentient beings. It will not be effective and you will not generate it. Sentient beings are the last focal object that you have. So as you can see here, when we meditate on compassion, basically we meditate on different types of suffering. So if you have really studied well and done those meditations in the small scope, it will be very useful because when we were studying the small scope, we talked about the suffering on, in different realms or different types of existence. So you will be able to recognize the great suffering of the hell beings and you will consider all the suffering in the hot hells and the cold hells. So that's very useful for generating compassion for them. In terms of the animals, you will consider specific sufferings of the animal realm, such as how they eat each other, they prey on each other, they are stupid, they cannot be trained in Dharma, they don't understand, and so forth. In terms of the suffering of the hungry gods, the ghosts, they experience the suffering of hunger and thirst and um, the um, different other types of obscurations that they have. Then in terms of humans, the humans also have the four types of suffering of birth, aging, sickness, death, the suffering of meeting with the unpleasant and the suffering of being separated from the pleasant. So actually we have gone through all those things. Then we have the suffering of the demigods and they experience the suffering of constant jealousy and conflict. Then we have the suffering of the gods of the desire realm who are actually bullied by the gods who have more power and they are expelled from their houses and so forth. And even in the higher realm, when we look at the gods of the higher realm, although they do not experience the suffering of suffering, nevertheless, they experience the suffering at, the, at death and transference because they have no power to overcome this experience of death and they know that they are falling into a lower realm. So like this, concentrate on different types of suffering in order to generate compassion. Okay, so then it says, once a genuine experience derived from a profound mental transformation due to the meditation on love and compassion is produced in this way, proceed to meditate on the next topic, which is supreme attitude. So first you meditate on love and compassion. This definitely has affected you. And then you move into the next topic, which is translated here as supreme attitude is a special intention. So when it comes to special intention, it is not mere words, because when you're meditating on love and compassion, you say, May all sentient beings have happiness. May they be free from suffering. I will make this come about. Please bless me to make this happen. However, at this point, it is still words. When you come to the state of special intention, you are determined. You have made the decision and you say, it falls upon me, myself alone. I will make sure that I will establish the cause, make them establish the causes of happiness myself alone I will clear away and remove all their suffering I will do it right? so it says I myself will bring about freedom from suffering and the cause of suffering for all sentient beings who are tortured by suffering and are deprived of happiness I myself will bring about their encountering happiness and the cause of happiness in particular and so forth you know it continues so it is said that actually there is that sense of responsibility when we meditate on repaying the kindness, when we meditate on love and compassion. But what changes at the next level and it becomes special intention, at the level of special intention is like you have made the decision that that's it, I am doing this. I am going to do this. So you make the decision to take the responsibility upon you. They give the example of, let's say, contemplating to engage in trade and business. 
as opposed to having actually make the decisions is that's it i'm starting the business okay so as we say we have uh, generated on love on compassion on special intention um which is in it uh, says i will bring about the freedom of sentient beings and says in particular i myself will bring about the attaining of perfect and complete buddhahood that is free from the two obscurations together with their imprints for all mother sentient beings i beseech you supreme guru hidden bless us so that we can practice in this way and when we reach the so with this with these three, three steps love compassion and special intention we have generated the mind that is intent to bring about the benefit of others following that the next step is to actually generate bodhicitta so next is to meditate on bodhicitta and uh, once meditating on the guru yidam on the top of your head contemplate as follows well then do we have the ability to place all sentient beings in the perfect and complete buddhahood because we have just reached this point where it says i will do it i will bring all sentient beings into the state of complete buddhahood so this is was the this was the comp- conclusion with special intention but then the question comes you know are you able to achieve anything like that at this stage we don't have the ability to place even one single being in the perfect and complete buddhahood furthermore even if we had attained the state of the two types of arhat we could only accomplish a limited benefit of beings and we would not have the ability to place all sentient beings in perfect buddhahood well then who has this type of ability a perfect and complete buddha as it so we contemplate that even becoming arhats still we would not have the ability to uh, bring other sentient beings to the state of buddhahood and even if we were to become bodhisattvas like if we see bodhisattvas on the path of accumulation of the path of preparation bodhisattvas who abide on the grounds from the first the second ground onwards and so forth these bodhisattvas have incredible powers miraculous powers great capacity however all the powers of those bodhisattvas when you compare them with the power and the ability of the buddha it is the difference between one speck of dust and a huge mountain and therefore it says in order to be able to bring all this about i really have to complete my own purpose in order to be able to bring about the purpose of others therefore i have to reach the state of a complete buddha because only the buddha has these qualities of body speech and mind and enlightened activities as we saw when we studied refuge so i must become a buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings So if we look at the structure of this training so first of all we train the mind that is seeking to bring about the welfare of others in that first of all we have to establish the basis for developing this attitude and the basis is first of all achieving equanimity and then uh we need to have affection for all sentient beings so this affection comes by recognizing all sentient beings our mothers remembering the kindness and wishing to repay their kindness after that we develop the mind that is seeking to bring about the um benefit actually developing the mind that is bringing about the benefit of others and this comes with cultivation of love compassion and then special intention after that once we have trained the mind seeking to bring about the welfare of others we train the mind seeking enlightenment because we realize that in order to actually benefit others we have to completely establish our own aim and reach the state of perfect enlightenment with a full set of qualities and following that we have to identify the actual mind of bodhicitta that is the result of this training we will stop here for today and we will continue with our next class with fully identifying this mind of buddhahood that is the mind that has the aspiration for reaching the state of enlightenment in order to benefit all mother sentient beings